So the idea is, the exercise is to get a fingerprint. So you have a dead body in a, in a house, let's say, and the parts that's, that's exposed to the elements, you know, the hands and the feet and the face, they will, it'll turn like leather. So the thumb is going to look like that, all hard. It's going to be uh, leathery, hard. There's no way you can get a print from there. So the exercise is to do that, to flatten it out and be able to get a print. Now... One way it's frowned upon here in San Francisco, but sometimes you have to remove the, the thumb. That's the very last resort. You're gonna take the thumb off at the, at the digit there. This is a thumb. It looks like a thumb. Sure, there's the fingernails. So there's the thumb, and the thumb is like this. No way that's gonna go on a card. So what you do is, Real simple, you have a, a container. They used to have these big old crocs back in Vancouver. Put formaldehyde in there. And you put salt, a dab of salt. No pepper, just salt. Put the salt in that to keep it buoyant. Put it in there for about 10 days. Come back, take the th thumb out. You've got rubber gloves on, of course. Well, most of the time. And very gently and daintily, you, you, don't, want it, you don't want to destroy the ridges um, that's on there. And now it's all nice and flat, and there you go. You got your print. The other one is if the people are in the water, um, the, you have a term called washerwoman hands, so you're probably going to get a good print from someone that's been in the ocean. However, they have to be retrieved from the ocean and you have people who really don't know, but they, their, their um, exercise is to get that body in the water and, and um, into the boat. So sometimes when they're grabbing the hands, um, they'll touch the hands and the skin will come off, a skin slip. So like a glove. And it'll stay on, if you're lucky, by where the fingernails are. So you, sometimes you won't lose it, but again, it comes off and it's torn off and you, you don't, you've lost the print but occasionally you can put it back on. Or if it's difficult to put it back on the thumb, you might be left with the skin, which is like a glove, and you'll take the piece of the thumb and very gently put it onto your own thumb or put it, you know, and then get your print. Put the ink on there and put that there. And as we're in my kitchen here, um, that's the end of this lesson. Next week I'll show you how to make a chicken casserole. So I was working with Super in 1987. I was driving a Super Shuttle van. I think it was $7 a ride. I think it's about 107 now, but, but it was seven bucks. Um, for a ride from San Francisco to the airport. But I, I, I came home one night, I, I made about $60 in, in tips, which wasn't bad actually back then. And um, when I went to my mailbox, there was an envelope there and it had my handwriting on it, oh, interesting. And it was for an interview at the medical examiner's office in San Francisco. And um, I, had, I had a history with that game anyway, because I'd spent 10 years at the coroner's office in Vancouver and then in England, uh, I had two years of working in a hospital as a porter and then ended up working in the autopsy room, which I hated because I knew half the people coming through. Maybe not personally, but, you know, uh, the guy from across the street or so on and so forth. So um, anyway, I, I, I cleaned myself up, 
um, clean my teeth, comb my hair, you know. And uh, off I went down to the medical examiner's office for this interview with the pathologist and the office manager and one of the investigators. And the, the pathologist says to me, well, what would make you uh, a good investigator, a good employee with our office? And I told him straight off the bat, I says, well, I have a fondness for babies, dogs, and old people. Not particularly in that order, but, uh, and I, I got the job. That's how, it, that's how it happened. Yes. So people would ask, um, what's the strangest case you've ever had, Graham? Or what's the weirdest? And there's so many strange, weird cases. But one in particular, I thought of it yesterday, actually, the Saturday morning golfer. Every Saturday morning, he used to play golf with his friend. I think he was a veteran. I don't know, Second World War vet or Korean, but he was a veteran. And uh, every Saturday morning, his buddy used to drive up to the house, honk the horn. He would come out of the garage with his golf clubs. Off they'd go every Saturday morning for years. Um, so anyway, this particular Saturday morning, of course, he drives up, honks the horn. He doesn't come to the, the garage door. So the police made a forced entry. I can't remember if they went round the back or they went through the garage door, and they found him dead in bed. Natural death, you know, just natural. They called my office. When I get there, of course, I didn't know all the details. When we get in the house, it's covered in dust. It's never been polished or nothing. It's just thick dust like Miss Faversham's house in, in um, Great Expectations. And uh, he'd, he'd lived with his mother. He'd never married, I don't think, but he was living with his mother. And his mother had died about 10 years before. 10 years. 10 years. And when we went to the living room, the, uh, the cop didn't mention anything to me. I walked in. I saw this huge mound behind the front door. I was speechless. It was huge. It was about this high. Halfway up the front door, maybe, maybe even higher, but it was a huge mound. And it'd been defecating behind the front door. Parts of it was rock hard. We, we knew what we were dealing with. This guy had been relieving himself, having bowel movements behind the front door. Uh, some of his underwear was packed in there, and, and some of it was fresh up on top. You could actually walk up this mound of fecal matter. It was like, it was like Kilimanjaro. I don't know what was going through his mind, but I, I, he'd probably been doing that since his mother had died 10 years ago. And this was a regular guy, played golf every Saturday morning, well-dressed, his friend had said. His friend never went into the house and we, we never mentioned it. Um, but um, that was strange. That was weird. So one particular day, um, there was a call. This girl from Taiwan and her boyfriend and a couple of friends were down at uh, Baker Beach, which is near Golden Gate Bridge. And they were waiting, and uh, it's like the old seventh wave, that rogue wave. They, uh, they weren't, apparently they weren't only up to their knees, but the old rogue wave came, swallowed them, and out they went, and uh, they did, uh, uh, get uh, the girl, but they never did find the boyfriend. He was washed out to sea. I don't think we ever found him. And of course, the paramedics came, they worked on her, but she had died, but they'd, they'd already, uh, they'd taken her to the emergency room. I, I can't remember whether it was Mount Zion or, or St. Francis. So finally I got to the emergency room because it was mayhem, it was, it was uh, chaos. There were, she had friends and relatives in the city who were Buddhists. And they believed that there was a chance that the soul of the body, um, uh, the body could come back to life again. 
So, but I wasn't about to argue with that because I'd already seen her and she was dead. So we were, I was doing all the paperwork and apparently they'd got the father frantic. They'd contacted him in Taiwan, I believe. And, and he, I spoke to him through an interpreter. When I had agreed to that, I said, okay, we wouldn't put it in the cooler. So we brought her back to the office. The phone went again, it was the father. Would I not leave her alone? Not only would we not put her in the cooler, but would, we, didn't, we didn't want her to be left alone. So I agreed to that too. I said, okay, I'll, I'll stay with her. So sure enough, it was around midnight, the next crew were coming in, wanted to know why I wasn't going home. I said, well, I'm gonna stay with the body. What? They thought I was crazy, but I'd made that promise. So I spent the night in the viewing room and uh, stayed with her. And each time the tape, we played this tape of chants, Tibetan chants. And every time it ran out, I would turn it over. So he played all night. Um, and I stayed with that, in that, that window, so many hours where she may come back to life. They, they, they thought I was crazy, but I said, hey, I promised the guy I gotta, I gotta do it. And the tragic thing was, she had drowned and she wasn't coming back to life. So anyway, I'm at work, and it was an afternoon shift, and uh, um, it was in the fall, so it was, uh, it was around 6 o'clock, and it was dark out at the time. And we got a call uh, that a guy had been dumpster diving. Um, anyway, he was dumpster diving and come across a, a torso, so we called the police, and um, um, everybody came to the scene, you know, the police and all, and I arrived, and um, sure enough, I went inside the dumpster, there was this torso. But I didn't move any further, that's what we saw. So we thought we'll get the, uh, the photo lab and the crime scene to come and process the, the, um, the, the area, it was in an alley. And then I got another call to go on. Um, and so I thought, well, it's, they're gonna be another couple hours, so we'll go do this call and come back. Of course, when I left the scene, the press was starting to uh, descend on the, on the crime scene. And of course, by the time I got back, an hour and a half or so later, there was press everywhere, uh, all on each side of the alley. We found more body parts. You know, the body had been obviously dismembered. So, um, so while I was in the dumpster, I got this epiphany. I thought there was a carpet in the dumpster, so I, I I talked to the leading detective and I, I said to him, look, what we'll do is we'll put the carpet in the bag, take the bag very gently out, out of the dumpster and put it on the stretcher. We'll put the stretcher into the back of the van and the press will leave. Because that's all really what they wanted. They wanted to see the body bag and the body going into the, into the, uh, into the van to finish off their story and they're willing to wait hours just to get that shot. So we put the carpet, which we were gonna keep anywhere, we put it inside the bag, and we took, carried the bag over the dumpster, onto the stretcher, put the stretcher into the back of the van. The press left, they all took off. So then we could get down to business, we could get all these, there were several body parts there, and now we could get them out one at a time in bags and put them on the stretcher. So the following morning, when I got home, I was watching the morning news and sure enough, there I was, <laughs> wheeling, the, wheeling the carpet into the back of the van. So I dodged the press on that one. I felt pretty good about that. I kind of thought, well, well they never got to see the body parts coming out of the dumpster. Really, respect for the dead, you know, really, but uh, I felt good about that. Um, so we arrive at the scene and the, there's yellow tape, don't cross, police line, don't cross, the policeman's protecting the door. We've got a possible homicide here. So there's the body lying face down on the kitchen floor. He's dressed in his T-shirt and his underwear, and he's got his socks on. There's black fecal matter 
around his underwear, black tar-like fecal matter. I can smell urine. I can smell, like I said earlier, the, the cigarette smoke, the, the, the dried blood. Uh, there's blood everywhere. Fingerprints, he's, he's been bleeding. He's been down for two or three days. He's on the turn, he's starting to decompose, and there's a terrible smell of urine. Whoa! And he's stale, and he's wet, and he's slippy. His skin's starting to slip. The urine, um, he's helping with the decomposition. So when I start moving him, not only is his underwear going to move, but also the first layer of skin on his back and his arms. He's a mess. I roll him over and I make sure. I don't see anything on his back. I lift the shirt up. There's a few bruises. Where did they come from? They're just, if I guess, yeah, that's, I see the bruises. He's banging into here. He's banging into here. Oh, there, he's drunk. He's got um, facial distortion. So his face is all flat because the way he's found, he doesn't look like anything like his photographs here. Oh, there's one of them right there. He looks like nothing like him, but we know it's him. Yeah, it's him. Luckily, he has a birthmark on his neck. There's one on the photograph. So this is Bob. It's, it's, <coughs> it's, <coughs> he's coughing up blood. This is where all the damage is done. This is where he has to come when he's having all these problems. He's got, look, so there'll be blood and tar-like uh, fecal matter on there. Aha, he's got a Tudor in there. He was uh, maybe a cocaine user at one time, a little mirror. Maybe he was, maybe somebody else was. Black tar-like fecal matter still stuck around the ball. There's no stab wounds. He hasn't stabbed himself. Nobody else has stabbed him. The whole place is locked up. Back door's locked, no forced entry. Front door's dead bolted. When the family came in, we're OK. Classic, the GI bleed the gastrointestinal blade. So what, what's been going on with this guy? What happened before he died? One thing I know is I hope it doesn't happen to me. I, I, I hope I get hit by a bus. I don't want to go through this. He was depressed maybe, or he's just a plain old drunk who likes to get pissed up and, uh, and have his fun. And then he, he sobers himself up and he goes to work on Monday and Fridays he starts drinking. I don't know, but he, he's on a binge and he's drinking everything in sight. What broke down in the engine? And really, it's the sieve. With all this stuff we consume, it goes through the liver. So the liver is destroyed. It's cirrhosis of the liver or hobnailing. And the liver is supposed to be like you see a bit of liver or a, a kidney, nice and soft. The liver's like that, like a piece of wood. It's rotted, it's finished, it's gone. And it can be the liver, the part of the body that can be replaced replenished, it can replenish itself. As long as you stop abusing your body, take care of it. But once it gets to that hobnailing, uh, um, severe cirrhosis, it's over. You get the GI bleed. That's what happens. This is the, uh, the Holocaust Memorial. It's, 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 it's a good thing that, they, that they've erected this. But there's nothing to say about it. You just look at it and have your own thoughts. It was um, right after, the day after 9-11. September the 12th, I was driving up, I was going up to the hospital to get a, a body, a body, someone had died at the hospital. And on the way to the hospital, we just came upon, me and my partner, we just came upon an accident, a pedestrian had been, he was crossing the street and a uh, semi-trailer was making the turn, the right turn, and ran over him. Anyway, I, w I went to help, um, and for a start, we're in the morgue wagon, and you know, the coroner's office, the medical examiner's office. But anyway, I went over to him, and he goes, "I can't, can't feel my legs. I can't feel my legs." So um, there was somebody there that gave me his jacket, and I put it under his head, and I, you know, I told him, "Oh, you're going to be okay. The ambulance is on its way." Somebody had called 911. This was all happening so fast. The crowd was gathering. And um, 
sure enough, the, the, the ambulance showed up within minutes, and um, my partner says, I think we should leave. You know, it didn't look too good, the morgue rig parked there. So we left and headed to the, to the hospital to pick up this body, and I said to my partner, I said, he was bad, man, he's bad. I, I bet we pick him up later. And sure enough, that afternoon, I got a phone call from the surgeon that he had died on the operating table. Anyway, we went and got him, and that was strange to see him alive one minute, and then we brought him back to the office. Um, we had to notify his family, and, and he was an only child. His mom um, um, asked me for weeks. She, she used to come down to the office. She made phone calls. She was an older lady, and you know about her son, and, and the fact that somebody had filmed it. I guess somebody from a from a building had, had, had filmed this, and I was in the shot as something by his side. I was kneeling beside him, and she wanted to know what he had said, and oh, it was just horrendous. Uh, she just, she needed some comfort. And um, and then she t tells me, she's standing at the counter, and she lifted her sleeve up. She says, my only son, and I'm a Holocaust survivor. In 1974, everything was changing. It was great. Got the job at the city morgue uh, in Vancouver. And uh, after, sort of into the, towards winter time, after a couple of months, you know, September, October, I was living there. I actually uh, needed a place to live. Um, so I was living in the basement. So I, and I was never late for work. But all the while, doing that job, it was not going to be permanent. It was just a, a means to an end because it was theater and acting. That was my dream. That's what all I ever wanted to be was to be an actor. By 75, um, um, I was uh, going down on Hastings Street. There was a place called the Actors Studio and uh, Molly Bowman, she, she had a, a school there and she was from the Lee Strasberg, who, you know, the New York theater. Um, and so while I was there, they got a grant the uh, Actors Studio got a grant um, uh, from the city and county of Vancouver um, to get this building. They, got a, they were going to get this building. They said, oh, we're going to move to a fire station. It's the Fire Hall Theatre, and um, right next to the morgue. <laughs> so there I was uh, working at the morgue in the afternoons and midnight shift. And during the day, there I was poncing around, dancing and singing. and doing everything to become a great actor at the, at the actor's studio, the Fire Hall Theatre. 88, medical examiner's office, but still doing theatre, still uh, performing, uh, uh, acting, doing uh, improv. I was in an improv group back in 85, food, gas and lodgings, and did some stand-up. And... But the thing was that there was a lot of things going on at the office. And one day, uh, while we were performing, doing these shows, this horrible ca case came through the office. This guy, Carnage, I think that's the best description, up in Sonoma County in April of 1989, wiped out his family. His, his, his supervisor at the winery, he killed his wife, his two sister-in-laws. Um, his three children. Anyway, he, he, he thought he'd murdered eight people, but in actual fact, he, he'd murdered seven with a 22 Ruger and a knife. And, uh, but one of them survived, the youngest baby. And so we spent the whole weekend uh, working on these cases, horrendous. But I had the theater. There I was, up to my neck, in, in carnage and mayhem, and I remember as it approached six o'clock, we were working all day. I'd looked at my clock, uh, the watch. I said to Dr. Stevens, I said, six o'clock, curtain at eight. You know, he, kn he knew that I was doing the show. 
profession that's stressful or well any 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 job in any walk of life you have to have another outlet um, and uh, a lot of the guys had you know they worked on their cars they were car racers motorcycle drivers they did other sports they did things and mine was the theater that was my outlet So the guy lives in the Midwest. He's estranged from his sister and mother. And then he decides to make a phone call. He hadn't been in contact with them for a while. You know, months, years. So he called his sister. They were talking. Healing wounds, old wounds, family wounds. And uh, he asked about mom and she said, oh, mom died. Mom died almost two years ago. She died. I mean, why didn't you tell me? Well, you know, they weren't speaking, and uh, you know, we're, we're not speaking to each other. He goes, well, well, you should have called me. You know, I mean. Anyway, they they hung the phone up on each other. So a couple of days went by, and he, I guess he thought about it, and so he decided to make a trip to the city, and uh, unannounced, of course. And he came home, knocked on the door. His sister answered the door, and I suppose there was a few exchanges, probably pleasant. They got talking, and he said, Where, where's Mum's buried? I mean, did you cremate her or did you bury her? She said, oh, no, she's still here. He said, what? She said, no, she's still here. She's in the bedroom. <laughs> he, uh, he went into the bedroom, the locked bedroom, and there was Mum in bed. She'd been there about two years. They ended up taking her away in an ambulance. I mean, I don't think she broke the law or anything, but, well, I suppose she did in a way, but there was, you know, there was no wrongdoing. Mum died of a, a... We took her back to the office and there was... We, uh, there was no foul play or anything, but she just didn't want to say goodbye to her, I guess, and she lived alone now, and she kept Mum in the house, and that happens quite a bit around the globe. People do have been known to keep their loved ones in the house, especially when there's just two people and one dies. So he got a shock when he, uh, he did get to see his mom after all. But uh, she was mummified, of course. So it's summertime, you've got a decomposed body uh, at home. It's a solitary death, obviously. Um, and uh, she's lying dead, Auntie Betty. She's basically rotted. She's rotted um, on the the uh, living room floor. She's um, she's unidentifiable. So she's been there for a month or two in this really hot room. Uh, the facial features have gone. She has grey hair. If I was to move her head that hair would just slide off the skull. The eyes have gone, um, but the nose has been eaten away. So you're looking at, nearly looking at like a skull with, with dark flesh on. The first part of the body to go is usually the abdomen. Um, you know, this area here, this part of the body is going to go green. Why is that? Because that's where all the bacteria is. That's all the, with the food. And then you get the fly larva. Uh, Blowflies, they start live, laying eggs in the eyes and the nose, and it looks like dreaded cheese. What do flies do? They fly. Um, and it's funny because when we get into the house, this is a dark, dreary home. There's thousands of flies. A lot of them have, have escaped 
when the paramedics came and the police or the firemen to make a forced entry. But there's still several hundred of them flying around. And so when they're walking on the body, um, they'll start doing their... They're, they're walking around, so all the light areas, none of the dark places, you'll see all these thousands and thousands of little dots. It can be mistaken for blood spatter. The sister comes from Boonesville. They hated each other. They never liked each other. Kind of like uh, what happened to baby Jane. Um, if I wasn't in this wheelchair, but you are, Blanche, you are. Um, so let's say uh, Tallulah comes to visit Auntie Betty and Auntie Betty kills Tallulah and leaves Tallulah on the floor. Meanwhile, Auntie Betty's back living it up in New York or whatever she is with Tallulah's money. So that's why we have to be careful that it's not Tallulah, that it really is Auntie Betty, uh, because there's no way of knowing, because she's so, she's, she's just melted into the carpet. And as luck happened, as we were rolling her in to the bag, aha, the left hand, it's clasped, uh, which tells me probably maybe she had a heart attack and she clasped that hand, whatever, uh, the, the fingers, and it's been sort of resting under her thigh. It's deep, still de it's decomposing with the rest of the body. But uh, when I look and I, I open up the fingers, ha, ah, my lucky dear, yeah, she's got the prints. So I have to be protective of that. I'll cover that up with a towel or something and we'll get her back to the, um, to the office and I can uh, hopefully get that print to say that is Auntie Betty, it's not Tallulah. So it's one of the th thrills of my life. I've had a few, not a whole lot, but real thrills. I get to work with Sir Derek Jacobi. The one and only. So I'm going to, so I'm going to be doing this movie with them, and um, we're staying at Crosby Hall. Crosby Hall is his fancy hotel in the middle of the Lake District, and uh, so we've been on the set all day, and we're coming back in the limousine. My bags are in the trunk, and as we approach the hotel, he goes, um, uh, "So it's supper, Graham." I went. Yeah, yeah, okay, so I'll meet you in the bar at seven. It's like, so I check into the, into my room. I'm like, I'm really, I'm, it's, I, I, I'm, I'm speechless. It's like, I'm so excited. I'm gonna be actually doing this scene with them. I've done one scene with them. I'm gonna be doing a couple more. Anyway, so I take a bath and I get my clean jeans on, clean T-shirt, and uh, I go down into the bar and there's all these toffee nose gets standing at the bar there with their husbands and wives and they're all there fancy dressed up, uh, rich gets. And I'm sure he knows this, but I go into the bar and I'm a kind of a bit out of my depth and they're all staring at me like, what am I doing here? And he could see that from the bar. He was in the bay window of the bar and he shouted to me, Graham, hello. And I looked and there he was. And I went over to him and he asked me what I was wanting to drink. I said, I'll have a pint of beer. So he went up to the bar, he got a pint, he got me my pint of beer and he had his glass of wine. Because he could see what was happening. But anyway, when I went up to the bar this, this time, they all spoke to me. Oh, hello, 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 how are you? See, they didn't want to know me before. They didn't know I, who, who I was, and they still didn't know, but they knew I was drinking with Sir Derek Jacobi, and he bought me a drink. So they didn't know if I was a director, or they didn't know who I was. Maybe some of the guys go, oh, darling, is that Russell Crowe? Is it, I don't think so, no, who, who is it? You know, because he just finished the movie Gladiator with Russell Crowe, but, but uh, yeah, they, they, they taught me, diff they, they, they treated me different when they saw me with Sir Derek. And he was such a great guy, a real gentleman. I had always enjoyed theatre. I'd done a lot, but did I, little, little did I know I'd get to be in a movie with Sir Derek Jacobi. Yeah.
So uh, th this happened many years ago. I was working in the autopsy room and uh, I was on day shift. So I, I get into work about 7.30 and I go up into the front office to get a cup of coffee. And uh, the two midnight guys are there. And uh, so they look at me and they say, have you been in the cooler yet, Cowley? I said, no. I said, I've just come get a cup of coffee. Uh, anyway, I got my coffee and went down to the cooler. And uh, so I opened it up and there's three bodies in there that had come in on the night shift. They had to be autopsied that day. But there was a fourth gurney with a sheet on it, partially covering it. Oh, pulls the sheet off. Strange. There's a willow pattern plate there right in the middle of the, the gurney with a uh, testicle and... Uh, oh. Hello? Yes. Hey, how you doing? Right. Right. Sure, let's do it tomorrow. That's great. Okay, all right. Well, we'll sort it out tomorrow then. That'll be great. So I, I, I'll, I'll, we'll set it for 1.30 tomorrow and I'll pick you up. Great, fantastic, thanks, Teresa. Still, that's the only, I've still got the brand new microwave. The old one went and the old toaster and the new toaster's gone. We've got the old microwave. Oh, all right, I'll see you then. Um, where was I? Um, where was I? On the... Testicles. Testicles, testicles. So, uh, opened up the cooler and the three, three bodies. Uh, oh, and then there was the gurney where I pulled the sheet back with the willow pattern plate with penis and testicles on it. So, turns out that the guy had cut off his business somewhere in, uh, outside the city limits, drove into the city um, uh, with, with, the, with the plate and uh, the penis and testicles and left it on the guy's uh, front doorstep, as you do, then caught a bus and went down to the ocean, threw himself in the ocean. So he washes up the next day. And of uh, course, we knew who he, wa who he was because we, we didn't need to do any fingerprints or any uh, dental uh, x-rays. Because uh, everything fit together. No, oh, that was that. Yeah. Another day at the office.
What's that better? Yeah. I had to go and do a notification at uh, in the Tenderloin here. I don't know what the actual story was about. I, think. I guess the son had died and the, and the father had lived, lived in one of the, the hotels here. Of course, we're in the Tenderloin right now, as you can see. And um, so I landed at the, the front of the, uh, the hotel and uh, took the elevator up. I know he was up, I think it was maybe eight floors. There was no answer at the father's uh, apartment door. So rather than take the elevator, the rickety elevator, I decided I would walk down the uh, stairs. So I, I got down a couple of flights, and then I could smell smoke. And I saw smoke coming out of the, from under the door. Um, I banged on the door, there was no answer. So I smashed the door in. And of course I got that, I guess what you call backdraft. Just as I burst the door open, the flames started going up the wall, the right side of the wall. There was a, um, a, uh, a table, a, a dressing table with a mirror, and the, the whole thing caught fire. That was on fire, and the wall. And when I went, walked further in to the, uh, to the hot hotel room, a small room, there was no bathroom or anything in there. There was a little sink in the corner. There was a guy, naked, an older guy, lying on top of the bed. And, uh, uh, and uh, what's that, love? Oh, cigarettes? Yeah. So, um, and, uh, <coughs> these two. One oh, for later. So All right. Um, so, um, uh, you're welcome. So, um, we, um, so there's the guy naked on the, on the bed. And uh, so I grabbed him, and of course he started to fight me. I mean, I, he was in a deep sleep. And I dragged him out into to the hallway, and then I went back into the, uh, into the, into the room, to the hotel room, and luckily, um, I mean, I was overwhelmed. There was flames going up the walls. People were starting to come out of their, um, uh, their rooms. There was a bucket, a five-gallon bucket of... Um, a five-gallon bucket of, uh, of urine, uh, which I grabbed, and I threw that on the wall and the dressing table, took some blankets and put out the fire put the fire out. By this time, the manager had come and people were standing around. The guy, had, somebody had given him a sheet, or maybe I might have to cover himself up. Um, and it was all over. I was disheveled. <laughs> I was covered in smoke and smack. So I, I continued on down the stairs. And as I walked out onto the street here, um, the fire truck was just pulling up, the fire engine <laughs> with the battalion chief. And uh, he was n not pleased that I was parked outside the front of the hotel uh, on the sidewalk. So he, we had a few niceties. He told me to move his, uh, to move my, my rig, the morgue rig. And uh, <laughs> I told him, I said, yeah, the job's done. And by the way, there's been an accident. Uh, as we were shooting this, uh, there's been an accident down there. That's the sound that I dislike, the sound of, of fire engines and ambulances. It's, it grates on my nerves after all these years. So, um, after I got my master's degree in dishwashing in Chinatown, you know, I went from small dishes into the big pans. I mean, I was, I was a great dishwasher. I did it for a whole year. Um, I decided to move on. Then the money ran out, and uh, I ended up uh, on the street. Um, I was homeless. 1980, at the end of 85, beginning of 86. And the weather was just like this, too, very mild. But it was January, February, and... Um, so I was living on a bench in front of UN Plaza on Market Street. In fact, the benches now they've put, you could stretch right out on the bench, but they put dividers in, so you couldn't lie down on them. But that was after my stretch on the benches. But that's where I spent two weeks. 
um, I'd actually, after I, uh, well, I was living in North Beach at the time when I was a dishwasher, and um, when the when I when I quit that, my money ran out because I'd been staying at the um, the Stratford on Powell Street where the cable cars are. The only thing that attracted me to the that hotel was the name, the Stratford, Stratford upon Avon. But anyway, when I went there, oh, what a dump! It was terrible. You used to have to wear shoes to take a shower. There was syringes and. God knows what, everything, and, and uh, but anyway, I spent several days there, and then of course I had no, couldn't pay the, the hotel bill, so I did a runner. I owed them, I think, two two nights, two days, so I took off with a bag, and walked up and down Market Street and found my bench. So I always remembered that too, when, when, when I was doing my job with the medical examiner, you know where I came from, uh, in San Francisco. Um, I was a homeless guy, and um, so I always give respect to the homeless people. I, I, um, I never, never made any enemies with with the people that I dealt with. So. But anyway, I was working the day shift, and we get a call from the sheriff's office, which was unusual, really, because they never called us unless it was a death in the jail or something. Then we got calls from them. So anyway, gets a call from the sheriff's office that apparently um, he'd gone to, a, to the house, this house in the Mission District, to evict a guy, evict him from his house. So anyway, so we, we get over to the scene, and the sheriff's there, and the reporting police officer, and uh, so they let us into the house. Now, I just remember walking down these stairs. It was a beautiful big home, two-story, but he had a, a basement. We went down these stone steps to this really nice uh, den, you know, TV set and stuff. It was sparse, but nice sound system and, and his TV. And uh, he's sitting there in his armchair uh, with a plastic bag over his head. He's dressed in his pajamas and a, um, and a, and a, um, uh, a robe. And he's got, so he's got the bag over his head, and he, at the side table, he's got some few pills, uh, some Valium, I think it was, and some other brand of medication, and a half tumbler of water. And um, uh, so anyway, no note, but, but he's got a cassette tape in front of him on the side table. So we played that. Basically, he was saying he'd lost his job, he didn't have any money, um, couldn't afford the mortgage for the house, and there was no, uh, nothing that he could do, um, except that's the only thing he, that was the end, was to, to kill himself, to take his own life. Um, anyway, so we were there about an hour, and the sheriff left, and me and the cop took care of all his property and everything. And sad, it was a sad case. While, just as we were, like, leaving and getting ready to head out, gets another phone call from the sheriff's office. Another eviction. It's like, so anyway, so we've got this guy in the rig, and we drive to, to the Mount Davidson area, and we go to this nice alcove, this ranch-style home, and the guy there had, had hung himself, and he didn't own the property, he was renting it, but he too was being evicted. Um, and I, I noticed on the door I was, I was entering, there was the eviction notice. They put that up there um, on the door. So he'd done the same thing, um, taking his own life, he hung himself. Ah, horrible stuff. Couldn't afford to pay his rent. So here it was, uh, the same thing, you know, two in one day evictions. Um, and, but I noticed while I was there, the sheriff had left. He wasn't there. In fact, when I got there, he had gone. He'd done his thing, but he'd left. Um, and I was wondering if he was feeling the same as me. Maybe he didn't want to look me in the eye. You know, maybe he felt like I did, sick to his stomach. So anyway, it was still a beautiful day in the neighborhood. And uh, on my way home, I thought, ah, I'm not going home. I, I went and got a six pack and I come down here sat on the beach, drank a few beers, watched the sunset. And while I was doing that, I was thinking about the sheriff. 
was thinking, I wonder what he's doing right now. I wonder how he feels. was my day? Well, July 27th, 1995. An interesting call came in at about 11 o'clock. A crime scene called the office and said that they'd possibly found a body in the park. They found some um, fresh earth piled in a pile with stones and uh, logs about it. Apparently this lady was walking by the same place last night with her dog and then walked I did this morning and saw this grave site. So they had about 15 or 16 people there, crime scene photographers, uh, a bunch of cops did the whole place tipped off. To the left of this little uh, this grave site was a kitty litter box. Well, no, let's just dig. But there's, a, no, well, there's a footprint on this pile of dirt. So they, they lifted off a footprint and then they started to dig. And lo and behold, after a quick yank of this loose soil, we brought out this box. Still thinking maybe, oh, God forbid, it may have been a baby or something. And um, so we, sure enough, there it was, we found a cat. So at the price of about uh, $5,000 for that, for that investigation, we discovered a cat. So the moral of the story is, Save all your videotapes to see how good you look 20 years ago. <laughs> yeah. Hello. 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 But anyway, one particular day, um, got a call to the Tenderloin, decomposed body, and um, I. Um, I walked into the apartment and the kid, well, kid, he was younger than I was, um, was found dead on, the, on his couch and he'd been dead a while, so. Uh, but what I noticed was when I walked into the, his studio apartment, he had three posters up there. Uh, the Stones, The Who, Pink Floyd, Strange. I had uh, three concerts that I'd been to while living in this city. And it turns out that the kid who I didn't recognize, when we got to his wallet, I recognized um, who he was. Um, and the thing was that when I first met him, he'd never been to a rock concert before. I'd been to hundreds, especially living in Vancouver, um, in England. Saw a lot of my favorite rock bands. But anyway, I, I had a spare ticket for the Steel Wheels concert the Rolling Stones concert over in Auckland, not long after the earthquake. So um, I, I had the spare ticket, so he came along, and uh, it was great because uh, in, instead of enjoying the Stones, which I did anyway, but I got a bigger kick out of him seeing the Stones uh, for the first time, seeing it, being to a rock concert for the first time. Then, of course, took him to The Who and, and Pink Floyd, because he was so thrilled. And uh, that was my thrill, was to, to be part of his enjoyment, to see these bands. And uh, we always got really good tickets uh, up close. So that, that as I said, it threw me. I was thinking, and maybe in the back of my mind, it might have been him. I don't know, for some reason, but those three posters were three concerts that I took the kid to. Anyway, it turns out it was him. So that was tough. But uh, when his family came, um, I, um, I helped them, you know, make arrangements and everything. Of course, and I went to his funeral. So, as I said, it was unavoidable. It was gonna, that was going to happen.
Here we are at the um, AIDS Memorial in uh, Golden Gate Park, San Francisco. Um, they call it the Grove. And um, this is where people come who have lost loved ones and uh, just remember, I guess. The, the records show that um, I think it was the summer of 81. Uh, that's what Larry Kramer said anyway. That's when it first came to light, when it was first published. But for me, it, uh, I, was, well, I wasn't aware of it at the time, but it was uh, in, in late 1980, when I was working in Vancouver at the coroner's office, we got several young males that came through the office with pneumonia, um, fluid on the lungs, and we had no idea what it was. It's 32 years, 33, 32 years later, it's still here. It hasn't gone away. Um, and there really isn't a lot in them. Um, I don't want to get preachy here, I'm not preaching. And because there's a lot being said about it, and a lot of people smarter than I. Um, and I'm not good with figures, I just remember dates and times. But um, you don't hear about it, it's, it's been swept under the rug. Um, I think MTV occasionally, uh, VH1, the music stations occasionally in commercials, but you never see it. You never see any advertisements anymore. It's been totally swept under the rug. So uh, right now, uh, 2013, there's, um, according to the newspaper, there's about 35,000 people in San Francisco that's um, has HIV and AIDS, but they're not dying uh, like they did 20 years ago. But I never, uh, it never crossed my mind looking back. Um, sure, I was aware we were in the middle of a, an epidemic, um, but I'd survived uh, the, the Vancouver office. Um, and uh, so I never actually thought about it. But when I started working, when I got uh, I started off in the autopsy room as a technician, helping the pathologist to do autopsies. Oh, my Lord. They were coming in in droves, plethoras. <laughs> my God, there was a lot of um, AIDS cases that came um, through the office, just day after day after day. Um, young men looking like old men, you know, wasting syndrome. Because I think of all the... Um, all the caseworkers and um, um, the nurses and and some of those people, um, um, the uh, city employees throughout the globe, um, not just San Francisco, got infected uh, for some reason or another by uh, a scalpel or um, a syringe. They stuck themselves and and got sick and died. And a lot of people that lived in the city were, um, because they were gay, they were, they were, they'd fallen out, you know, it wasn't as like it is today, but they'd been um, um, blacklisted or thrown aside because they'd come out to their family or friends. And so they moved from wherever they lived in America and came here where they were welcome. And, um, um, and so when they died, we had, sometimes we had a tough time trying to notify family, so we'd have to bring these cases, although they died from, from um, they eventually called it natural process. We had to come up with some term, natural process, but uh, wasting syndrome, but it was the AIDS, they died from AIDS. By the way, I'm sitting on this rock, huh? I've got to say, and look, um, Sylvester, he was a performer in uh, San Francisco. I don't think you'll mind me sitting here in loving memory of Sylvester, you make me feel. That was his, um, that was his sign signature tune, Sylvester. He was a character. I actually got to see him live. He was a great dancer and singer. So I was working on, um, um, I did a stint on Market Street um, uh, after I got off the street. Dr. Whitland 
Marvin Whitland. I was working at his, uh, he was an optometrist. So I was working on Market Street, you know, um, selling glasses and making appointments for him and just general and repairing glasses. And 1986, uh, the door opens and in walks Eric with his friend Yvette Robinson. And uh, my life changed forever. <laughs> He, he joined these other two cowboys, <laughs> Brian Freeman and uh, Joel uh, Branner, and the, the three of them put this, uh, this show together, uh, Pomo Afro Homos. I always used to mess it up, Pomo Afro Homos, or Pomo Afro Homos, Postmodern African American Homosexuals. That was 1991, so you can imagine uh, um, these three guys traveling around the country and Europe. They did all these these, uh, these shows and it was so popular. They started off at Joseph's on Market Street. People were lining up around the block. And of course, Eric was was uh, out of the closet, of course, um, about a hundred miles outside the closet. And I was in the closet about a hundred miles. Um, you know, it was the relationship that wouldn't work. We had nothing in common, another thing, music, he was listening to hip hop and gospel. I was listening to the Stones, rock and roll, you know. Um, and uh, but we had we had theatre, the theatre we had in common. But uh, yeah, the relationship that wouldn't work. And uh, we were together right up 16 years. So well, actually, it was nearly almost 18. But 16 years we lived together. What happened to me was uh, death came to my door. You know, uh, Eric uh, was diagnosed in um, 1989 when we were doing a show together down at the Chi Chi Club in uh, North Beach in uh, San Francisco. Uh, Ken Vega show, Cafe Depresso, and we ra ran that show for t two to three years on and off. And it was the earthquake that um, put the cag, cag wash on that. We, we stopped, was eight, but th that's when Eric told me in 89. And uh, he was concerned that uh, I was going to leave him. But uh, I said, no, I mean, why, why, why would I do that? I really loved him. It was, it was the, the best years of my life. Um, but he, um, from 89, he handled it with the medications. And then 1998 was the first time he really got sick. We bounced back. and. Um, uh, then he and we did a lot of traveling, and then in 2002 he got sick again, bounced back. You know, everything comes in threes. But of course, uh, on his birthday, uh, March 8th, um, uh, 2003, got sick, ended up in the hospital, uh, dealt with that. You know, and uh, but after the funeral and. Everybody's gone. Uh, I, I, um, I started to fall apart. Um, <laughs> I lost my mind. There's maybe a better way to explain it. I, um, I lost my mind. I, uh, I did everything wrong. I, uh, I wanted to deal with it on my own, um, which was a mistake. Yeah, you, you grieve on your own, I think. That's what you have to do. You, that you can't. That, that has to be done alone. But just getting through life every day, you've got to have your friends and your neighbours and your family around you. And I, uh, that was my mistake. No, I'm I'm going to deal with this on my own. And that's when I fell apart. But um, here I am talking, <laughs> gab gab gab. Um, so uh, anyway, um, Eric. Uh, I'll explain that to you. And he did this piece. He, he wrote it and directed it. And uh, Patrick Scully uh, produced it. So anyway, here's this piece that he did in uh, 1998 about living with AIDS. And uh, so see what you think. I, I don't know if it, it should be any different. I'm alive. That's different. I'm still black and gay now. That's really different. Well, no, my father isn't as fucked up as other fathers. I mean, he never called me a faggot. My friend Peanut got his jaw broken in two places when he told his father. Well, yeah, my mother knows. 
My father doesn't. Guess he does now. I mean, I'm not sure if my brothers do, but the entire planet knows I'm homosexual. I hope. Well, one of the hardest parts is not to internalize other people's fear, you know, other people's shame, other people's stuff. I listen to gospel music. Sometimes I feel just a bit compartmentalized, you know. I think uh, things are better now in some ways. Nine years ago, I would have taken a deep breath and fallen quietly off the face of the earth. I don't think that anymore. Well, the drugs, they work for me. I'm a slave to them, but I, I would be dead without them. Well, I just don't feel ashamed. I can talk to other gay men and trade survival stories, you know, regain my sex mostly, and I can get on living. Well, a lot of the guys think the disease is gone. They just think it's gone. I don't, I don't have that luxury. Cells are down. So this is the last combination. Sometimes I tell people, sometimes I don't. Usually, if I'm asked, don't ever give up. <laughs> Some guys would never sleep with a negative. Do you know how many brothers have HIV? A lot. Here we are down in the mission, what I was talking about earlier, about this painting, and uh, we ran into this gentleman. What's your name? My name is Octavio. Octavio, yeah, Nice to meet you. Yeah. Nice to and meet you. Uh, I wasn't sure about the painting itself, but you know a little bit of history about it? Yes. About the priest and the brother? And... I know this was done in memory of uh, uh, Father Richard. Uh, it was done by Laura, and uh, this is the front of the house, the Victorian. This is the dog Tomita, uh, which is known throughout the uh, neighborhood. But what he did is uh, the last thing that I, uh, last project that he worked on was that he took uh, terminally ill uh, people uh, and he basically counseled them and gave them comfort uh, uh, to the end of days. Right. So uh, he's well known in, in, in the community, respected. Uh, and and, and he, he passed away too. He did? passed away, when, yes. When was that? Uh, this is about a year ago. Oh, really? Oh, that's, a, that's... a year ago. Uh -huh. yes. So, yes, uh, as far as I can remember, this goes uh, Father Richard uh, with his charity work, uh, he goes back all the way to 1982. As far as I can remember. Right. So that was at the crisis yes. of the time, yeah. Apparently, you can see the tree were. Uh, how he branched out and, and fruited out and helped people, and then he, the, the earth claimed him, and again, there's a regrowth. It's basically a cycle, a never-ending story, which is, is it, I think, it, it's for everybody to decide and decipher what, what, what is the meaning. Uh, everybody can put their own story together. Right, you know? yeah. But that's how he got to San Francisco, because his brother was living here and, 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 and had AIDS, I believe. Yes. And then the, the father came up to, to take care of his brother, and his brother passed on. And then the father decided to start this, this non-profit, uh, like a hospice. A hospice, it was a yes, hospice. A hospice, palliative yeah. care. Right. It, it, basically, they're going to keep giving back to the, to, to right, the community. Right, to the community. It says they were in loving memory, Father Richard Purcell. Purcell, right. Love and compassion. Amor y compasión. Amor y yes. compasión. That's to say my name's on it. I mean, there's my, uh, right here. Okay. Yeah, I put oh, my well. name. That's me. Uh, a friend of mine from work, he, um, he, he gave money to the, to this, to the right, Martyrs place. Right. Okay, he so. was a, so the, the artist said, you know, okay. to give donate, and he, do you want anybody's name to go on? So it was uh, me and my uh, partner who died. He died of, of AIDS in uh, 2003. Grandfather, he lived till he's in his 90s, and he was a drinker. And he smoked and drank up to the day he died. So you just don't know what the genes are. 
in this fascinating, amazing piece of machinery that the baby Jesus or whoever made us. I think I came, I was a tadpole. I, I came out of a pool of water. My fins turned into arms, legs. Um, and I can sing and dance. And occasionally it falls down, you know, it, fa it falls apart. But yeah, it is an amazing piece of machinery. It really is. It's fascinating. And I've seen every corner and angle of it. And do you know how lucky I am to have to, to seen the human body? There's nothing better. Human bodies are great. They're your friends, they're your families. They help you move, you know? They loan you money. They take you in off the street. They, they take care of you, you know? It's great. The human body is an amazing thing. You can fall in love with it. You can sleep next to it. Um, but we do all these things to it. I've had my moments too of loss and dying and, and we're, we're all gonna get it. Nobody goes through life without losing a loved one. And I, my job was to try and make it as easy for the family with respect that I, that I could, you know. That's what I, that was my job. I, I was a representative for the city and county of San Francisco. People never forget you. you, you people, families are at the lowest ebb. They're, they're in pain. You, you have to try and help them to get through the initial shock. I mean, they're gonna have their grieving after you've gone and you've driven off with their loved one. But I was lucky and honored to be able to be part of that, to help people. I, I, I hope people, I was good and kind to people when I was at their houses, invading their, their space, uh, coming into their, into their private moments when they lost someone they care for. Uh, that I did it right, and I did a good investigation, and I, and I think I did. I think I, I did a good job. Yeah. And that's the way it is. What a trip. What a trip. We set off to see the world and lost our way. Instead of seeing other nations, we destroyed our relationship a trip. What a trip. Our relationship started coming undone. In London, in Paris, we fought night and day. By the time we got to Rome, I really wanted to go home. Or anywhere at all to get away. I should perhaps explain that we fought like hell in Spain. We waged our own civil war rather wittily. And in France, our romance didn't seem to stand a chance. But in Italy, we made up rather prettily. What a trip. What a trip. We set off to see the world and went astray. Instead of seeing other nations, we dissected our relationship a trip. What a trip. We thought we'd finally found some peace on an island in Greece where we spent the summer drinking Red Cena. The only problem then was that she slept with other men while I pursued a German Fräulein named Christina. We had originally planned to go to India overland, but we stayed on our Greek island for a year or more. Then Sarah said, I love you, Jack, and I think we should go back. I don't know who I am or what I'm looking for. What a trip! We demolished our relationship a trip What a trip A real bummer